All right. So we move to the skin, from the soil to the animals, soil, water, grass, sheep, humans, dogs, guardian dogs. <laughs> and shearing time comes, and we've heard about some of the costs related to that. And then there's what I call the metabolizers, the people who are like the modern day chefs who take our local material and make it um, something you can wear as a chef would turn the food into something that you can eat. And so on the panel today, we have uh, this, this group who does a, a range of metabolizing these raw materials, this wool, um, from bespoke to mechanization. Uh, we have Mariah, uh, Mariah Resnick here, who is in the center. And she's going to start by narrating her process. She does use mechanical knitting processes. We also are going to share with you the bespoke or the, um, the hand knit methods that are used um, both by Emily Canito and Marley DeSwart. And this is just a range of ways, like I've said, to um, make these materials something that you would see around us. Again, pretty fundamental and simple, but what are the nuances and intricacies behind what you do? So we're gonna start by taking two to four minutes, that's okay, um, to describe, and we'll start with Mariah, to describe your knitting or sweater making background, a little bit of your education, some of the material preferences that you have. So a little bit of an overview. And I have your slides and I will go through them cool. with you. I started knitting when I was seven. And, and can you hear her in the back, sorry? Yeah, so sound up and closer maybe. I started knitting when I was seven years old. This is a picture of me in an outfit that my grandpa sent me from his clothing store in Indiana. Um, can you hear? So yeah. fashion is kind of in my blood and also I've just been doing this a very long time and people ask me how long it takes for me to make one of my pieces and I'll, offer, I'll often answer 30 years. Um, and then I got my first knitting machine in 2005. It's plastic, cardboard, but I was able to make my wedding dress on it. Turned out really beautiful. And then um, found the internet in 2008 and started publishing a lot of hand knitting patterns on Knitty, Ravelry, and um, let's see. Let's. I. I uh, then I got my first motorized computerized machine in, let's see, 2008, it's pass up, and I started offering knitting services to people. I uh, <clears throat> trained in New York, I trained in Germany, and I took out a really big loan, uh, a six-figure loan, to get an industrial stole machine. And I've got it paid off, and I'm getting another machine. <laughs> I have, I have other business debt, but the machines paid off. Um, I started running my apparel business, and I did a lot of trade shows and wholesale. And then we had a retail store in North Beach in San Francisco <clears throat> for about a year and a half. And I learned about that side of the business. Um, unfortunately, we closed because the rent was really high. Um, and now I am full-time offering knitting services mostly to apparel brands, but also I love working with farmers and yarn companies and um, learning about their needs. Um, so I love working with natural fibers. I'm concerned about synthetic fibers in our oceans and I'm concerned about the environment, I'm concerned about labor, so I love working with natural fibers and farmers. And that's, oh, there it is. <laughs> the guanaco. Guanaco. <laughs> Oh, Guanaco, so soft. Um, so Emily, would you like to do the same and just go over your, your practice? Sure. Okay. okay. Can you guys hear me? This work? Um, so my name's Emily, and um, I actually do more bespoke style knitwear. Um, I'm more interested in hand knitting, um, pattern making, things like that. I do also use um, machines as well, but not like Mariah's. They're, um, they're more akin to a home sewing machine, but it's a, it's a knitting machine. Um, but my background, I've really been dabbling in pattern making and clothes since I was a kid also. Um, when I was a child, I didn't knit as much. I did more sewing. Um, 
I was constantly cutting up my clothes and, you know, much to the chagrin of my mother. <laughs> um, but currently, I'm, I'm more interested in the relationship between the person that's making their clothes and um, the designer. So I'm, I'm less interested in making things for people to purchase, but more interested in making patterns to help people make their own clothes. Um, I also teach knitting. I've been doing that for about six years. And I really love that because I find it's very empowering for people to learn how to make their own clothes. And people really get to see what it takes to make a garment. And I always have this conversation with new knitters that are like, oh my gosh, it takes so long. And now everyone wants me to make them hats or make them sweaters. And it's going to cost $200. And I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, so I, I really love that. And I'm very passionate about um, natural materials. I love wool. Um, I mostly work with wool. And I love you know, this community and people that are doing what they're doing to create, um, to create this really amazing relationship and the community that it creates between people that make their clothes and people um, all along the chain. So, mm, Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Marley? Hi. I'm Marley Deswart. Um, I own Black Mountain Weavers in Point Reyes Station, which is a little cooperative of fiber artists, all local. Um, I have been knitting forever. <laughs> I was so young, knitting and spinning. Um, I tend to hand knit everything I make. I tend to... Um, make everything new. I hardly ever repeat a pattern. Um, just recently, I decided I should put some of those down. So I created a book with my patterns. All of these are made from local wool. I work very closely with several alpaca farmers and several wool farmers that are very close to me. Basically, I drive there. I pick out the fleeces while they're shearing, and uh, that's what I work with. So I literally go from a raw fleece, I scour it, I spin it, and then I knit it. And not all my garments are done that way. I also, uh, um, I usually buy about five fleeces that I send off to the mill and have it mill spun. Um, and a lot of the sweaters are done that way, and they're mill spun in YOLO, so close. So that's, yeah, that's it, I think, that says it. Oh, that's it, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Just pick out the fleece and wash it <laughs> and hand spin it and make these pieces. Um, so I don't know if Marley can see, but... I can. Um, we are showing some of the pieces that were done before the Berkeley Art Museum was demolished and rebuilt. We had a free-for-all photo shoot in there, and we got to bring a lot of the pieces that both Marley and other of the artisans who collaborate with farmers in our community to the museum to do this particular photo shoot, just so you nice. know the reference nice. point yeah. that's going on above your head. Um, and again, our models are all either in the agrarian lifestyle, um, right, is Alison Arnold, who raises Angora sheep and um, milk goat, milking goats uh, in Woodacre. And, um, I, I don't think the woman on the left is, um, was baking bread at the time that we engaged her in this photo shoot. But anyway, yeah. local models, local wool, yes. local location, yes. yeah. that's what's above your head. Yeah. All right, so for uh, a couple of minutes, I won't, I'm gonna go to, back to Mariah to describe the time. So we've talked on that a little bit, but what are the processes that you go through and what is the time related to those processes? Um, and help pe people understand time. Um, <clears throat> well, if we know what yarn that we're uh, using, we can go into developing a fabric and then go into developing a product. But you can get bogged down at any one of those steps if we're still trying to figure out what yarn we want to use and where we're going to get it and where it's going to come from. That could take anywhere from four to 20 hours of work for me making phone calls and hooking it up. Um, so it's, it's the biggest time, I have a lot of information on this slide I know, but the biggest time suck overall 
is making decisions and then sticking with those decisions through the process and not backtracking. Um, which, but it's really important uh, on my platform and the way that I work to be careful about making those decisions and carrying them through because it's gonna affect everything down the chain. And the way that it works best for working with me is when we make a large volume of pieces or continue to make the same style again and again <laughs> over time um, and really develop it and refine it. If you only need a few, it really doesn't make sense to work with me because it's a big time investment for setup. And once we get it set up, we can very quickly make many, many pieces, um, but it's not as flexible. So I want product development slide. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and the reason why we are yeah, all behind oh, yeah. this is just so you know, if we move forward to look at the screen, we get feedback. So just so you know I'm why we have this <laughs> neck stretching going on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, with the product development, I've had some, especially working with smaller runs of farm yarn, or farm-based yarn, or yarn company yarn, sometimes uh, product development gets slowed down because of quality issues with the yarn. And I can work with any yarn, and I'm happy to work with yarn that a lot of the larger industrial manufacturers would turn away because it's got vegetable matter in it, or it's got knots in it, or it's on very small skeins, or it's not even on cones. I still want to support you guys getting your product to market. And, but <clears throat> it can cause problems for me. It can slow the process down. And the image of this slide is showing a garment that has twisting from yarn that's been overspun and is, has too much uh, uh, twist in it, and then trying to explain the problem. It's, it can slow us down if I feel like I'm not being heard or the mill won't accept <laughs> my analysis of what's happening. Mm. Um, so I have a lot of experience with this and I don't want to uh, create conflict or be negative about what's going on. I really just want to support you and I'm being honest about what's happening when we're putting the yarn into my machine. Awesome, thank you. and then the product development. Do you want to speak to sizing at all? Sizing is uh, challenging because clothes used to be made in a bespoke way um, up to the 50s. People would have garments made for them. It's, and a lot of customers are having problems finding clothes that fit them in the store. And uh, a lot of times people have brand loyalty because that particular brand creates products that have a proportion like their body. So. When we make a decision on sizing, we can look at another brand that you like and try to copy their sizing. Um, but another option that I offer is we could create a style and then have your customers, when they pre-order and give me their sizes, and I can make pieces one at a time for your customers. It's a very unique service. I'm happy to do it. It's expensive because I have to make a brand new pattern for each customer but I'm, I feel like it's such a unique service and it's such a unique opportunity um, to give people something that's just for them. I'm happy to do it. Um, but there are no standards. People will tell me, uh, make uh, three sizes unisex. I, can't, I, I can do it, but I'm gonna have a lot of follow-up questions. I need you to tell me how big are your customers? And there's gonna be a lot of, if you do do that, you're gonna have a lot of customers who are disappointed because none of them fit. Good to know. <laughs> so, Marley, would you speak to um, the time related to the process uh, for, for yourself, if you can even talk about time, or is it just... It's enormous. Enormous. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what can I say about it? Because the process of going from a raw fleece, scouring it, um, carding it, uh, prepping it, spinning it, that's one section. Then knitting it is a whole different thing. I mean, I, I went through my list of clothing that I brought here, and I thought, well, this is what I've priced it at. How much time did it take me? Hmm. Some sweaters that are bulky, 
hand spun bulky, they go very fast. They may be three hours, four hours knitting, and I've got a garment, I've got a vest, or I've got a sweater. Um, of course, the time of spinning is not included in that. If I s knit with an extremely fine gauge, uh, a two-ply fine gauge, it takes me 20, 30 hours it can. So when you sell a garment, um, it, you never get the money back. Basically, you cannot make a living doing this. You can supplement a little bit, but you can't make a living. I've tried knitting machines. I do not like the process. I love the feel of, of the wool and know which sheep it is and know, know about the animal. Hmm. But if you look at the panel that was here before and the cost that they, the, go through to get a fleece. Then I look at what I go through. It's unbelievable. Maybe we're just realizing <laughs> what real life takes again. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's part of the deep learning of making things again in your own community. It's like, well, we all go, oh, how is this going to work? How are we going to dress everyone? It's like, well, we actually just all have to kind of reassemble the value structure. And yeah. when we change that, our relationship to time and each other and animals. And we've just really, I mean, it's hard to understand how um, programmed we have become to understand the economy as it is. And we've been selecting for one major variable that we measure to a T, which has been money. And we've correlated it to everything we do, including now time. So the value structures will need to shift fundamentally to bring regional economies into their full fruition. So that's what I'm learning from you as I'm listening. Yeah. <laughs> but having said that, when you have one of these garments, they last a lifetime. Ah, cost per wear, if we're going to go so back to money. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, and some of your pieces, um, I mean, they're being shown above, but just that it is something you would want to send yes. down to the next generation. Yeah. They're timeless. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Emily. <laughs> Talk about time. <laughs> time, okay. Um, I mean, similar, my process is similar um, to Marley's in the sense that I do more hand knitting. And even when I use a machine, um, it's still, you're still doing it by hand. Um, you're, you're moving the carriage back and forth. You're putting pieces together. Um, but I think for me, usually a design will start with a seed of an idea and it kind of percolates for a while, um, and I'll draw things out, and I, I like to use um, paper that has inches on it, and I'll draw it out, you know, physically. Um, but a lot of times, it's just, it's the whole process that's time consuming when you're making something um, from, you know, nothing to a finished garment. Um, I also take a lot of inspiration from material, so I usually start with the material and then the idea. Um, but I think one of the most time consuming things for me personally is just proportions and then math. So, you know, there's a lot of math involved when you're doing a pattern, and especially if you're doing a pattern for someone else to read and recreate. Um, and you think about different people's bodies, and I'm sure, you know, both of these ladies have <laughs> a lot of experience with that too. Um, so it's a lot to consider. Um, and I think one thing that for people to understand is when they actually do it, they, they can get a grasp of how much it takes to make a garment. And I think any garment, even if you knit or if you sew or um, anything like that, I think that's one thing at least I really love about my teaching, like I said, is that people, they learn, they're like, oh my gosh, this, is, this takes so much work. And you get a whole new understanding of clothing, um, even from clothing that you buy in stores. Um, mm. And I think that, um, yeah, the whole process is it's time consuming. But like Rebecca was saying, I think it's, um, it's something we've kind of become disconnected with in the same way that we become disconnected with food. Um, and, you know, once you cook for yourself, it's the same thing. You're like, oh, wow, I'm making pesto. And you have to blend all of these things together before you can even put it on pasta. And um, I think we're moving back towards that and it's a really exciting time to see um, 
people kind of reframing clothing in that way for themselves in their minds and um, especially working within communities of people who are producers of the fiber themselves. I mean, talking about going from a fleece to your, your yarn and spinning. And I also started spinning recently too, so I, I really love it. <laughs> um, nice. mm -hmm. but, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think for our remaining time, uh, we are gonna merge, if it's okay, the knit along into this conversation. Um, so just before we do that, Mariah and Marley, are there any things you'd like to just actually help in summate? It could be what you'd most like people to understand before we weave this, these two together. Um, <clears throat> I can't compete with mass market prices. What I'm offering, even though I'm offering industrial services access to industrial level production and trying to bridge the gap for people because I'm committed to this fiber shed and my equipment and my services to this fiber shed. Um, so I want to figure out a way to make it work, but uh, it's, it's hard sometimes also uh, from a consumer level to understand the distortions in the marketplace um, and that uh, there, we don't want to compete on price. Um, it's, it's, it's a race to the bottom and I refuse to do that. Um, and I also really want to support labor through my business is another huge commitment of mine. So I wanna pay my workers really well and I want us all to sustain ourselves financially through engaging in this way and figuring out a way to make it work so that we can capture part of the market share that cares. Mm -hmm. And so it takes all of us spreading that message in every opportunity we can. Mm, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, If I may, um, I would like to mention two things. One is that it's absolutely fantastic to go through the process. It is very satisfying. I've gotten to know many farmers. They're my best friends. It's wonderful to be among the animals. So it's, it's absolutely worth it. Having said that you have to learn it, um, Mimi of Windrush Farm and myself, give classes, we literally in the spring, starting with a new series, uh, where we give you a fleece, you're there at shearing time, we give you a fleece, and we take you through the whole process hmm. to an end garment. When does your class start? In January sometime, I've got flyers. Beautiful. So you can learn it, you literally, you will learn how to spin, how to clean the fleece, how to do everything in order to get a garment. The other thing I would like to promote, if I may. Please. This is, I just published this book, which is all local um, uh, patrons. They're hand-knit patrons. It's all local wool, local models, local, local, everything is local. The uh, woman on the cover is doing a dye demonstration. Yes. In the tent. <laughs> um, so, and the patrons are... I think quite nice. I would say so. And many of them were in the pictures that yeah. you saw. Thank you so much. Before we go to the Nilons, give them a round of applause. <laughs> so before we um, adjourn, we just wanted to um, come together to talk to you about um, how the theme of prosumption, uh, we are finding and exploring the idea of where consumers and producers come together. And so the knit along is again a, a practice or a project based on practice. So I will let Heather and Emily describe their work to this, in this beautiful model. Thank you. Well, you, um, you can see here Heather is modeling the sh one of the shawls. Um, so we're, we're doing a knit along. So the idea is this shawl pattern is adaptable really to any type of yarn and any type of gauge. So you, yeah. So you could, um, you know, you could go to any of the, the lovely producers here, choose yarn and um, make this shawl. And part of that is um, engaging with this idea that I think Rebecca mentioned about uh, prosumption 
which is kind of the engagement between the consumer and the producer and you being the maker. Um, so within this space, um, you create new ways of innovation. You also create community. Um, and so did you want to talk a little bit about it too? Yeah, Heather, so Heather had this idea, so I wanted We were really inspired by the energy that the knitting community um, is often able to pull together around the idea of a knit along. And this hasn't been done in the Fiber Shed Network before, and we thought it would be a great way to really promote all of our producers in our network, both here in Northern California, um, but also through the whole Fiber Shed affiliate network, um, to bring people together around the idea of knitting something in a community setting um, based on one particular pattern, but that is that is absolutely unique and intrinsic to your experience in your geography and connecting with the farmers and the land around you. So Emily designed a pattern specifically for this project, which is this shawl pattern, uh, that's intended to, to be a simple enough pattern that it really highlights the, the yarn itself, the fiber itself. You can see it has a lot of stuck in it, stitch in it. it it really um, gives you a chance to just work with and see the fibers that we all have in our fiber shed to work with. It's very adaptable. You can use it with any, any weight of yarn. And we have several examples here today. Um, the one I'm wearing is a, about a, like a DK weight. It's from Mary Pettisarly's twirl yarn. Um, and we have this one that Emily made with Janet Hepler's Merino. It's a, like a worsted Aran weight. You can, you can come and we have a table out in the lobby where these are on display. There's also a fingering weight Icelandic yarn that Jess brought from the Fiber Shed affiliate in Minnesota with her. So these are sort of the pre-samples um, that we made before today to inspire our whole community to get involved with making this shawl in a yarn that, that you've chosen through deepening a relationship with a farmer in, in your fiber shed. So, so here today, you guys all have the amazing opportunity to, to source your yarn at this event. Um, after today, people who haven't come here will, will be promoting this for the next four weeks um, through all of fiber sheds. Communications outlets will be sending out blog posts and will be posting on Instagram and and on uh, Facebook and encouraging everyone who wants to get involved with this to promote this too. And we really see this as a way to expand our network of awareness and experience with local fiber. So we have, um, just in terms of the practicalities of how to get involved, we have some copies of the pattern here today that you can purchase, but it's also very easy to download it on Ravelry and we have Every, every vendor here has a little postcard that you can take with you, or we have more postcards at the table in there that describes a little bit of what we're doing and shows you where to access the pattern. Um, do you want to say a few other things? Um, I did want to say that it's very, um, it's beginner, so it's easy, um, easy access. <laughs> it's not too complicated. Um, it also has a variation where it's made with triangles, so you can kind of add or subtract based on how much yarn is available or what you personally connect with. Um, the pattern is written really to help you through the process of starting with a yarn that could be variable and helping you, you move forward on that. So there's a chart um, on the pattern that every vendor has that will help you figure out how much yardage you'll need based on what um, thickness of yarn it is, and then the pattern will walk you through figuring out how to adapt the sizing to your yarn. Um, just to mention a little bit more about the structure of the knit along, on the, the new Fiber Shed website, there's a, a page for the knit along. There's going to be a place for you to register. We want to try to keep track of the breadth of this project and how many people are participating and where you're from. Uh, we really want to share the stories that you're bringing to this project of the farmers and the yarn and the fiber and the colors that are coming from your fiber shed. So we encourage you to use whatever communication you have just with your friends' word of mouth and on social media as well with the hashtag fiber shed K-A-L for knit along um, and any other hashtags that have to do with bringing awareness and promotion to those farmers who are knitting um, 
who produced your fiber. We have um, a small group of uh, knitters that are going to be kind of highlighted on our blog and working along with everyone. We're really excited to have many of the local yarn stores in the Bay Area here supporting this project. So if you go into those yarn stores at um, Castaway and Folk in Santa Rosa, and to Knitterly in Petaluma, and to Imagine It in San Francisco, and Verb for Keeping Warm in Oakland, all of those yarn stores are members of Fiber Shed and are, are um, you know, engaged with this project and can help you get started. And we have knitters at each of those stores who are going to be posting pictures of their project and telling a little, sharing a little bit about their story. So we'll be hearing from Justine and Shelley and Diane um, as we go along. And we also actually have a, a couple of knitters from outside of this area who are contributing because this really is something that anyone anywhere can do um, to, to engage with their fiber shed and to really, like Rebecca was explaining, to, we, we can take this into our own hands as, um, as makers and we can bridge that gap between being consumers um, and, and connecting with the people who are growing the fiber. So we have a, a woman from Australia, Ani Lee, who will be telling us the story of her Australian-based uh, shawl that she's knitting. And we have a woman, Kathy Cadigan, in Washington State. So there's, there's um, you know, an opportunity for all of our Fiber Shed affiliates to be involved as well. And we have some prizes as well. So um, we have some uh, wool felt, uh, hot pads that Jackie Post has donated. We have some seed packets from Red Twig Farm, and we may have some other prizes coming up from other producers as well. Um, what else, Emily? I think. Oh, so just in terms of sourcing the yarn, we, we do have this project called the Wool Book, which a lot of people are probably familiar with. We have the Wool Book on display out in the lobby, and you're welcome to come and look at that. That's a great way to source and learn about local yarn particularly when you're not in a place like this. Today you have the, the living wool book in front of you, so you can walk around to our vendors. But come and learn about the wool book as another way to uh, get in touch with what your options are for local fibers. Yeah, so now we're going to have a, this two-hour break in the, in the program here. Uh, there's going to be demonstrations happening. Will there be demonstrations in this room? So in the tent, okay, they'll be, they'll be spinning up here with Robin. And outside in the tent, we have angora rabbits. Um, we're going to have shearing. There's primitive breeds of sheep and cashmere goats. And there's uh, natural dye demonstrations happening out there. There's also more wool vendors out there in that tent. So please make your way out there. All the vendors now in this room will be free to interact with you for the next two hours. And, and you can visit all of those. And um, if you guys have questions about yarn, just flag us down. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you.